So this, this bell, you want to tell the story? Sure. <laughs> then we get to it. It's a little gentler ring, I think. Okay, I'm not a... Although not a, I have never actually been there, but um, huh. this, this, the story of this bell is actually a pretty special day for, I guess, New York theater. Uh, hello, I'm Mayan, I'm the associate producer of Under the Radar Festival. And uh, to the day, uh, 2011 was, is today the um, anniversary of Helen Stewart's uh, passing. And uh, what she used to do was to ring a bell before every performance at La Mama and we do the program. So I hear, I wasn't there. Um, and uh, we were working with La Mama during the festival and uh, Ellen passed in this amazing, glorious activities. And so uh, we, this is actually one of the bells that we rang at every performance during the festival uh, in 2010. So we have decided that it would be a nice way to just sort of start a little ritual. And um, I want to give you Andy Hordes of Culture Bot. Hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for, for coming. Thank you, Mei Yen. Oh, sorry. Um, so I, I, I want to welcome everyone here to the second uh, Scanning the Landscape uh, uh, event as part of Under the Radar Festival. Um, today we're going to have a discussion about um, social practice <coughs> and performance. Um, we have gathered a, a very wonderful, esteemed group of, of people from all over the world um, to talk about that. They have uh, name tags here, temple te uh, on the t on the on the thing on the table, table right? <laughs> and, um, and on the, the temple chair <laughs> here um, as well. Sorry, because I want to. Um, because the point is that there are empty right. chairs at the table, so. One of the things is that, okay, so a little bit of background. This is, we're gonna be using something called the long table format. It was developed by Lois Weaver, the wonderful Lois Weaver, um, as a way, it was based on the film Antonia's Line, where she starts making dinner and more and more people keep coming over and the table keeps getting longer and longer until eventually they have to move out into the yard. And everyone is welcome and everyone comes and shares. And um, we had heard about it for a while, um, but then last year we did a couple of um, panel discussions under the radar, and particularly after one on visual art performance versus contemporary performance, we got a lot of very smart people coming up and going, you know, the presentational aesthetics of the panel discussion reinforce the power dynamics that you're trying to subvert. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, you're right. So how do we, how do we try and work against that? Um, you know, and, 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 and horizontalize the situation a little bit. So this year um, we're doing that. Um, uh, also, you tend to spend a lot of time with everyone sort of making their opening statements and who they are, and then, you know, 45 minutes of the time is gone. So you have programs, um, pretty much everyone except for um, Bartosz here who's visiting us from Poland, and unfortunately we had an email thing. So everyone but Bartosz has their bio in the program. So, and they will say who they are, and you can see, see that, and so you can check that out then. Um, and, um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So you mentioned there were empty seats at the table. What about the empty seats? Right, uh, thank you, <laughs> Welcome, I hope you're having a good festival. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I'm just getting over cold, so I'm a little not at the top of my game. Um, the empty seats at the table are for you uh, to come up to the table if you have a question or a statement. We ask that you know when you come up um, or come. I mean that's why we were trying to fill it in and try and make this a little less presentational. We're sort of limited architecturally with what we can do here. Um, but uh, if you have a question or a statement or w care to participate, please come, take a seat, say who you are, say your piece. Uh, if someone leaves the table, you're welcome to take your seat. If they want it back, please give that back to them. Um, you know, we ask, you know, if you look in their program, there will, you will see a guide of etiquette for the long table on the first page. Um, and um, that's basically it. And then, we, and then at, you know, about 125, we will um, conclude. Um, but of course, the conversation is never over. It's just sort of on pause until we pick it up again. Um, I want to thank Mei Yin and Mark, who just 
came in for giving us this opportunity. Um, I want to thank all these wonderful people for giving their time and all of you for joining us um, for what is sure to be an exciting conversation. Um, also, today's host, uh, so the whole idea is it's like a dinner party, um, and the host of today's dinner party is Ruth wickler -Luker. Um, she will help uh, keep the conversation going or embrace the silence or whatever needs to happen. Uh, so thank you, and uh, I will leave it to you. And you. Uh, okay, so just to you we, we won't be taking questions from the audience. If you, so have, you have a question, you have to, to come table. to the table. Yeah. Um, okay, so welcome everybody, and thank you all for being at this long table. Um, I think we will take a, just a minute to kind of say each person uh, your name, a little, just a little snippet about what you do, and then um, I'd love to talk about common ground, common challenges. Um, one really exciting thing about this table is that uh, there are lots of people working at very different, uh, in very different spheres, in very different um, levels and roles in the artistic process um, and the non-artistic process. So we have, I think, we'll have a very interesting conversation that will will be more uh, eclectic than maybe everyone has been at. In the past, so very exciting. So, can we start with you? Okay, hi, I'm Benzel Bilga. I work for the Goethe Institute. I'm the cultural programs director there. Um, so, I'm in charge of the programs here in New York, um, and also I coordinate the programs in North America. Lately, I've been interested in fostering a little bit more um, programming in North and South America at the intersection between um, politics and, and the arts. So, I'm here to represent a big institution. I'm less a curator and less an artist but more like somebody who tries to enable stuff at these intersections. I'm very uh, excited to be here and to talk to all of you. And everybody here? No. 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 <laughs> I'm Jan Cohen Cruz. Come to the <laughs> <laughs> uh, A lot of my work has been through universities trying to get young artists out of the universities and into the world you can't spend 24 7 in the studio and become an artist but you've got to spend some of the time in the studio i've done it through writing through projects through through teaching and partnerships and then through a national organization called imagining america artists and scholars in public life i'm gonzalo casal <laughs> deputy director of the museo del barrio i'm going to speak in twitter language you know the hashtags are cultural organizer um social um Art as a tool for social change and cultural producer. My name is Sarah Zatz. I'm the associate director of Ping Chong and Company. And at Ping Chong and Company, one of the things I do is manage our Undesirable Elements series, which is an oral history theater series using real people on stage telling <coughs> their stories of difference in different communities around the country and the world. Uh, my name is Michael Rode. I am fighting a cold this morning. I apologize. Um, I'm the artistic director of Sojourn Theatre and the director of the Center for Performance and Civic Practice. I also teach at Northwestern University in the theater and performance studies programs. And I would say that in addition to making work, uh, I'm really engaged right now in conversations about um, advocating for and demonstrating the capacity of the arts to um, to increase civic capacity in our communities and at varying levels of uh, the practice of democracy. Uh, my name is Edwin Kalt. I teach at the Iberoamerican University in Mexico City. And there I also work with several theater companies and dance companies, which are very related to social awareness or social, some sort of political social practice. And uh, I run a little uh, festival forum there called Reposiciones, which uh, tries to question the ways uh, performing arts are being produced and aesthetically thought of and conceived in Mexico City. I believe that we're all meant to speak to each other, but th this part of yeah, the conversation can ignore. be addressed out of context. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a camera here that's streaming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My name is Florian Malzacher. I'm a curator of performing arts, uh, running a festival in Germany. Um, my focus is, I guess, on, on theater that is rather non-dramatic, post-dramatic, on dance that is rather conceptual, etc. Uh, as a dramaturg, I've worked with uh, groups like uh, the Mini Protocol or Nature Theatre of Oklahoma. I've also wrote about them. And uh, recently, in the last years and months, um, I have more and more focus on the question of the, the relationship between arts and politics and the, the common ground in between. And, and very explicitly, also, like in, in really directly engaged, not only 
only visual arts and theater channel. Uh, Bartosz Szydłowski, I am theater director and I run the venue <coughs> theater in the district, post-industrial district of Krakow, it's called Nowa Huta. Uh, uh, we are mostly realizing big project, social artistic project for re revitalization of the district. And I also run the festival which is called Divine Comedy in Krakow, which is mostly focused on presentation of Polish theater, but it's also guesting other, uh, other shows. It has strong influence also for development of my, my venue and district one. Hi, my name is Melanie Joseph, and I am the founder and one of the current stewards, one might say, of the Foundry Theater in New York City. Uh, we both make work um, from scratch, except we're about to do a classic text for the first time coming up, but primarily we um, make work from scratch by commission and then produce it and tour it often or sometimes. And um, from the beginning, we've also um, kind of focused on what it means to create context for that work, um, how, what that work lives inside of, and, and there's a lot of ways to think about it, and one of them is I feel like the sort of confluence of what it is that we do attempts to constellate a different kind of space for artists to be in the place, in, in endeavoring to change the world in a different kind of public space for artists to um, make partnerships in the remaking of the world daily. Uh, and I'm Simon Dove, I'm an independent curator. Um, my background really is in running art centers and festivals both in England and in the Netherlands. Um, the last five years I was at Arizona State University where we were really reinventing the dance curriculum to ensure that creative practice and socially engaged practice was central to the way students are thinking about their work. And now we've developed um, a cross art form uh, certificate in socially engaged practice at, at Arizona State. So that's a real, really good development. Here I'm a co curator of Crossing the Line, which is a really a transdisciplinary festival, happens every fall in New York, and really is about um, finding appropriate platforms for, I guess, key artists who are making important work today. So that's really uh, me. And I'm Ruth Wickley Looker. I um, live in Portland, <coughs> Oregon, and run uh, a presenter producer of socially relevant theater, Boom Arts, now. And I also work at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center um, in New York at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, so, what's wonderful about all the voices around the table? Everyone has very different roles, um, but it seems like a, a common, some common ground is the desire to um, both in, both honor the um, professional artist, but also connect the arts and non-arts uh, world. And everyone's doing that in very different ways, but I wonder um, if we could kind of start this conversation off by just talking about um, what your passions are and, and what concrete projects you're doing that um, take what's, you know, the value of professional art making and then also embrace the non-arts um, in order to kind of broaden the, the impact of the arts. That's a very broad question, but um, everyone's doing something like that in very specific ways. So let's start there. Mike. You're looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't everybody? Gonna, Everyone's doing that. I was just going to draw some. <laughs> Not ours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe a specific project that is, that, you know. This is such a funny format. Like, we just, it's a very strange format. Uh, interesting. Excited to be sitting here. <laughs> but, um, you know, when he comes to me and says, oh, do you want to talk about this? My first impulse at the dinner party is to say, yeah, 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 yes, yes. But what are you doing? Right. You know, right. but, 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 but if I'm at a thing where it's supposed to be this, then I'm happy to like lather on about six projects for a while. So I'm trying to figure out like how to how to honor a dinner party, but also like, I want to hear what Simon does. I like I want to hear what you guys do. Well, you know, I'll, let me. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm so excited. Like I, didn't, I, wanted, I wanted to stay out. I wanted to stay away from the dinner don't, party. Don't. I'm so excited. I, I, I mean, I, I just because I look around the table, I'm just like super excited by. Uh, we had a great discussion yesterday, uh, bringing uh, about European and U.S. exchange, and, and we've managed to sort of open it up. Uh, even more uh, uh, with uh, uh, Edwin here from Mexico and uh, Wenzel's project. And, and I guess one of the things that really bubbled up uh, yesterday 
was um, sort of about um, the challenges of practices across across borders and sort of the way we you know um, are dealing with these issues in different ways and I and um, so I, I guess I was really interested to sort of um, you know think about um, how how these things have different uh, different resonances in different parts of the world. When I was in Portland, Edwin uh, uh, gave a great um, speech uh, about the representation of the real in, in Latin American theater. And he also had a great uh, where they took the um, Yorostaya, but they only did the first two books of it. And then they brought people together. And then they were talking about the excitement of wanting to do it in Central America or Latin America, and Edwin, I think, I think it was you that very rightfully pointed out that it might not play so well there for a bunch of um, Anglo-Americans to come down and do a socially engaged piece about justice and freedom and participatory <laughs> democracy in Latin America when we have such a rough time, uh, uh, have such a bad history. So I, so I, so I think what, one of the things that was really fascinating to me uh, about having this amazing group of people at the table was sort of about what you're talking about, sort of that impulse, and I think what Melanie was talking about, this impulse to, to sort of do social justice, sort of enact social change through art and culture. But like, what are the, what are the, what, how does that impulse manifest in the work, and how does it manifest in different places? So I was just. Can I just say that in response yeah. to what you said, is that I think that we put issues in the, on the table, yeah. and that they all, we all contribute, so that the, the electricity is through the actual bounce back in conversation yeah, yeah. in this. Kind of, you know, awesome. We can launch it by talking about an issue. We can launch it by talking about a project. Whatever it is, whoever throws it in there, yeah. somebody's going to extract something. Out of it. I want to know what pro what difficulties people are facing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I want to know, like what are you wrestling to the ground in this regularly, all the time? Like that makes you think I can't do this anymore. I want to know. Not that I think I can't do this anymore, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But you know. I'm I'm a little dramatic, and so I have big feelings around challenges, and they come up all the damn time around thinking about this stuff and also articulating it to the world. And there are so many sort of troughs of meaning that we fall into immediately. There's so much encrusted language mm -hmm. that to say, how do we talk about this so that, how do we invite people into its consideration? What are the, what? Well, that's right. So well, now it's, now it's, it's translation. That's yeah. what I feel like you're talking about, translation not just of language, but of context and intentions and practices. Mm -hmm. So what I hear in your question is like, for me, when I think about the challenges, uh, particularly around working with artists and non-arts partners, myself and also supporting others, it's the question of how are we building languages, forms, opportunities for people who either come to the table with an appreciation and context for what assets artists bring, or for people who are not in the arts field but are interested in that conversation and how do we, in a non-sort of ownership way, say, well, let's have a conversation together and map assets and needs on all sides of the equation. And I'm, that's where I would take that question. Like, what are the challenges people are having when they're doing work in community? You talked about a large community revitalization process. I've never been to Poland. So I'm curious, when you do that work in Poland, is it a given that everybody understands that there's value in you doing that work, or are you having to translate to bring your assets to the table? But Michael, before we go there, yes, yeah. just because in the spirit of a, yes. a dinner table to yes. just get a little conversation station here, would you, would you um, share with the dinner table the difference you make between social practice and civic practice? Because I think those terms are two of the definitional terms sure. that will help us with the huh. conversation we're having. Sure, sure. I mean, for, for me, just in trying to come up with a way for the center to do work uh, in, different, in different locations, both geographic and also sort of contextual. Um, I've been sort of looking at social practice as arts-based projects or aesthetics-based projects that initiate with an artist's concept or vision, but that require partnership or collaboration with non-arts partners to implement or execute, whether those are shows or large-term processes or events or whatever they are, and that civic practice is based in relationships between artists and non-arts partners where the needs or desired outcomes of the non-arts partners are actually the sort of uh, primary impulse driving the partnership. And the artist is still bringing their aesthetics and their vision and their possibilities 
to that collaboration, but that civic practice sort of primatizes the needs and that social practice uh, originates and sort of pursues ethically, ideally, the artistic uh, sort of vision or concept. It's a continuum, not an either or, right. and it's messy and lots of artists blur in practice, but it's been helping me talk particularly to non-arts partners about the distinctions and how people work together. And Michael, can you use the words non-arts partners as <coughs> non-arts partners? Yes. <laughs> See, I'm dead when I do that. Yeah, I use it all the time. I'm dead when I do what? that. It's like saying yeah. the non-white people the or the non, it's like saying, I, I well, say I get sectors. killed. I often say civic right. sectors is what we say. Yeah, But I'm getting, sectors. I get, I'm getting stuck on this in my work a lot too with the arts partners. People are coming to me and saying, well, what does it mean when you're working with non-artists? And how do you let mm -hmm. people know that this is quality art? And I'm getting mm -hmm. really stuck on that. And so I've been thinking about that a lot this week uh, under the radar and the conversations we've been having. And the answer I came to is good art is good art. And I've seen really crappy professional art made by completely professional artists, 100% professional actors, professional theater companies, etc. And it's awful. And I've seen really beautiful art made by people who are not considered artists by the art world. And so for me, even getting into this question of what is an arts partner and a non-arts partner is tricky because you know, if you're talking to a community organization, you know, who are we to say that they're not artists? And well, then even American Red Cross, though, is not an arts organization. Sure. The, the mayor's sure. office is not an arts organization, regardless of what creativity. Right. So you're places. talking nice about organizations. Yeah. Or people. Yeah. Sectors or people. is different from Sectors. individuals. Than yeah. Yeah. But in, and then just the question of community is also something, you know, we talk about community engaged art, community engaged art. Gonzalo and I live in the same neighborhood. We both live in Jackson Heights. I don't know that we, <laughs> but I don't know that we live in the same community, even though it's For in real. Jackson yeah. Heights. Yeah. So even that conversation is something that I've been struggling with when you talk about community engaged uh, art. I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, like why are you guys, each of you doing this? Because in my case, we're the Museum of Brown People, so we're supposed to do it. <laughs> and, and also people think that we're great at doing that, and that's not true, none of those. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're just we're totally. in the same place as all of you. And then yeah. you know what I'm noticing more and more is that uh, although we're working hard on this, is that you know my colleagues now they realize that they have to do it for whatever reasons, and they're coming to us and they're trying to copy our model, which cannot be re Absolutely. replicated. <coughs> so um, what I always ask them is that you know why you want to do it. You know, I suppose that you know I need to do it because of funder, or I need to do it because you know I need to show some social responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I'm always curious. You know, again, for some reasons we don't have any, any other option. We have to do it. You know, for whatever reasons. But you know, I always curious to know. You know, those that you know, like they don't come for a culturally specific institution or, or, or represent a specific community. Um, where you guys are doing this, which is the first step. You know, for everybody else to understand. You know, how to do it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, it's a, why do you do it? Why do you do it? Well, I do it, um, I, I'm not an artist, I'm not a curator, and I guess, you know, I have a background in design, so I always saw artistic practice as a very functional thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I just, I don't understand art for most of the time, you know, but I understand it as a tool to get something accomplished. I'm very practical to that. And I don't think, you know, I ever saw it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that helped us, you know, understand, you know, um, the way the, that our museum has the practice is that, you know, what's at the center is people. And the, the work of art is a tool to create our experience around that. Um, I guess we do it because we don't know how to do it in any other way. But it's very interesting to describe. Yes, no, I was going to say, there's really critical reasons why it's important, and that's to do with the, you know, the arts as a way of engaging with the world, as a way of knowing the world we live in. And I think as we see all the structures around us you know, failing, whether that be economic ones or political ones or even religious and spiritual ones, the arts give us a real way of connecting as a, as a group of people around ways of thinking and ways of looking at how we want to build this world. And so for me, it's a critical way in which the arts, yeah, is a tool, but it's a vital way in which we can engage people in artistic practice and thinking about the ways in which they want to be an active you know, constituent in the way they want to build 
this world we're all inhabiting. And I get really worried when we, even us around the table, start to define artists and non-artists. If we're, if we're thinking in these separatist ways, we're already building the, the tools for our own destruction. You know, we need to find ways in which we can engage everyone in real creative artistic practice. And that's really a way of entering the art to an important part of all our thinking, not just the kind of marginal entertainment that we might do on a Friday night, but it's an incredible, incredible part of the way we think about you know, how, how society evolves and how we play a part in it. So, so can I, I, I um, there was a, a guy named Bob Alexander who founded and ran Living Stage in Washington, D.C., the 60s through the 90s, who some people here hopefully know about, but who was an amazing artist who had this thing that every human being is an artist. He talked about that and it was his life. And I was in Los Angeles in the mid-90s and I was doing a workshop for Cornerstone in a, in a community with folks, um, basically with, with, with day workers from a lot of different sectors. And I was using that, um, I was using that quote, we're all artists and we're here working together. And for me, it, it shifted the way that I, that I see sort of describing other people as artists as a way for me to acknowledge that we are all creative because what I got back that day and over the course of that week was, um, it's great you're here, this is, a, this is a good day, do not tell us what we are. I, I'm not telling you that you are what I do, don't tell me that I'm an artist. Really so cool. what I do is what I do, and we can talk about sort of our practice for the day, where the art is something we're coming together through. So I don't, I don't mean to generalize into artist and non-artist, but for me, the language of that, and the, for me, myself, the presumption of naming someone else in that way became a, a real um, point for yeah. me to figure out. I mean, everyone practice. uses labels. I think the critical thing is that we see everyone has a, a vital role to play in forming yes. and shaping the world we live Absolutely. in. Absolutely right, and not and just... that's what we're working with. When, whether we define it as, you know, a craftsperson, a, an artist, yes. it doesn't matter. Yes. We're all people with imaginations, yeah. and we're all people who have a stake in this planet, you know, in this yes. world we inhabit. And, and that's, that's and the critical thing. And it's that, it's the young, it's the, it's also the young artists who somehow think, well, if I'm an artist, if I want to do something around environmentalism or if I want to work with older people, that's something separate. So right. there, there are also right. these very um, overly defined sense of what it means to be an artist, even as we yes. can see everyone is creative, right. every right. artist is something besides their artist self. Right. And this recognition that we can live these hyphenated lives, sure. that we can combine the several things we care about, and that we can then, in terms of you know, the whole question of well, how do you assess it aesthetically, well, if the project isn't just about aesthetics, you don't just assess it aesthetically. Right. If we're using the term social practice, then we want to say what are the social goals as well as the aesthetic goals. And then we have to look at both and how we would assess it. And that's, I, I'm really struck by how much this term social practice has taken off. It's like way more popular than, you know, beyond the people who do it than community-based, grassroots. There's certain terms that have kind of like this pejorative connection, but social practice, man, everyone is really good with, which I think is great. But I think it's often the same thing that's been going on for hundreds of years. It'll change. It's, it's the current language. It's in a lot of books at the moment. It, and but it'll, it'll change. And, it, and in, yep. in a way, what we call it doesn't matter, as long as we understand what it is and how we can resource it and facilitate it. Dividing the, along the two lines, Michael, that you were talking about, too, um, allows for which, what agenda is leading or what, you know, what's, is it process or product that has to... So let, let's open up to the, our guests here. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you just say your name and then if you have a question? Sure. Yeah, my name is Elizabeth Koss, and I'm an art therapist by training. I taught at NYU, and I ran the first master's program in art therapy in Southeast Asia. Elizabeth, you're going to have to speak up because your back is to <coughs> everybody. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just mean at the table, oh, Okay, probably. I'm an art therapist, and I um, taught at NYU and ran the first master's program in Southeast Asia um, in art therapy. And um, when I came back here, um, when I returned to the U.S., I started documenting the art of Occupy, which I know is quite controversial, probably, uh, for many people to hear. But I think in comparison to much of what I see um, that's professionally done and commercially done, it, it's, it's so much better and real time and engaging and interesting. It's, it's to me, some of the best theater um, happening in the world. And I think this is happening globally um, in a lot of the revolutions and changes in the world, so I just felt that was an important part to, to consider in this discussion. Can, can you say what specifically is it engaging about the work? What, why do you say it's the most important at the moment? Because I feel it affects all of us, you know, that there's, we're engaged okay. because it has meaning for everybody. Um, we're all involved in this together, you know, all of these issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's corruption, whether it's we can't afford 
you know, our homes or whatever it is. Oh. So, yeah. so the quality comes from connection and engagement. I want to hear from, I want to respond to that, but I'm more interested in this right now. What, um, well, I didn't want to, I don't want to take the direction <coughs> off, but I wanted to go back to two <coughs> phrases that I heard that really were interesting to me. My name is Alex, by the way, I'm from New York City, I'm a performer. Um, and one was when you said um, that the feeling you get when you say non-artist is similar to the feeling you get when you say non-white. And the other one is when you brought up um, the difference in the cachet of the phrases grassroots and community-based versus social practice. So these are two like sort of linguistic and cultural issues that really interest me and, and bother me and, um, and kind of frustrate me. Like I don't know what to do about that. And what I hear is that social practice, the phrase, sounds educated. It sounds art world. Community grassroots sounds more non-white. It sounds more uneducated. It sounds like it lacks a certain legitimacy. And so it's so interesting to me because it sounds like what I hear you all saying is that you want to break through that sort of barrier or that social practice is about social engagement and community-based engagement. And you know, I think there's a racial element here and a class element here that I kind of don't know how to talk about and, and articulate in a more right. straightforward way because if we look around the room, it's pretty you know, visually apparent. So I was wondering if you guys have thoughts about that. Can I just add something very quickly? This idea of artists and non-artists, I'm not saying it's wrong at all. There is a distinct, you know, I think we're in media, we're in the, a language transition right now. And I, I, get, I, I don't feel personally really upset to say non-artists because I know what I mean. When I use that with other people, they pretty near kill me. So I want to be really clear that I'm struggling with these definitions right now as well. And also we have to have in mind that um, uh, what's key in this kind of work is that you know it's a horizontal dialogue. Absolutely. And then we can come up with a lot of definitions, but then you know you have to see what the, on the other side Absolutely. what definitions are coming up for you. So you can present yourself as a non-artist or we're all artists, but then you have to see how the others are looking at you and work with that. But you're trying to like establish that it's horizontal. Can you say your name, please? Oh, my name's Jose Perez IV. I'm a, I'm a fight choreographer. I'm a theater maker. Um, we could use a fight choreographer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, fig I figured that's what was lacking at the table. Um, but, but, but anyway, um, I've noticed this thing. I come from a place called Saginaw, Michigan. It's a smaller town, very racially divided, and very, um, I think, sort of set in its ways. And this thing happens when you present yourself as a creative type, where it's almost like the stigma gets put on you of saying like, because it's, it's very like, I don't know, it's very blue collar, it's very homophobic, it's very like white Catholic. That's where I came from. And so when you, when you sort of identify yourself outside of this bubble that they have, I feel that this, this color sort of gets put on you and it's hard to, like what we were talking about, sort of get your way in there. I, I've been really wondering about, let's say, let's say you're in a community like this that maybe isn't as embracing to the arts, but you want to do something for the community. You want to show them how like, an arts creative practice can solve maybe a social issue that's going on in this particular town. Coming, how do you get them to come out when they've painted you a certain way? You know, It is like that thing because People always tell me when I go back, because there is a Hispanic community, it's like, use that, use that, just use that community, you know? Because you won't get the other ones, because you already, you know, there are like racial things. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, how do you pierce? How do you get in there and get them to come out? How do you get them to trust you? I wonder, I would like to make sure that we include everybody who's also coming from other countries, um, perspectives as well, uh, whether that, whatever angle you could come in on that. But, I really think that this um, <laughs> this um, this term of translation was a really is a really really very essential term to this discussion because it's not only about like within the art world and outside but it's within the art world there are so many different voices and things that we when we um, when we were um, at this preliminary workshop with where Simon was there of on, of, a, of a project that we're planning to do um, with where we try to bring together different voices from different countries in North and South America and Germany and also from different disciplines, it really struck us that as to how, how, how long it actually takes to kind of like find a, find a language to, to speak about these things, Absolutely. about social practice, about relational aesthetics, about everything that's in there. So, so, so this, 
so, so I'm pretty sure that actually this distinction between the art world and the outside world is, 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 is valid because, because it is there, but there's also all sorts of different other sort of distinctions that, that, that I think translation is, is, a, is a core question. I want to kind of turn the, the, the discussion around a little bit. Sorry. I want to go back and, and take a few of the, of the ideas that have been sharing, but just kind of try to turn it somewhere else. I think your original question was very interesting, Melanie. Um, how do we produce and how do we face whatever we're trying to do with these things? And it's always the question, it, this question with social practice, whatever we want to yeah. call it, um, it always takes me back to ethnography. It's always the question of, and, and we're using all these words that are very common to ethnography, non-white, just, let's just translate it into non-artist or whatever, um, non-community, non-racially, whatever. Um, so why don't we take, why don't we go instead, I'm always concerned with, with social practice, there's always the question of how pragmatic can we be? Can we actually do how something what, for what? the community? Pragmatic. How pragmatic? Um, how, how, how practical, how, how, can, how much can we give a practical solution to whatever we're doing? I think in, in Andy's introduction and, and the concern that we were, we were talking about when, when the big art group was saying, oh, we want to take this, this work outside of Germany and the States, which were the only two countries where they had actually presented it. Um, and they said, oh, we want to take it to Central and South America, just like, like that. And, and I know Wenzel, will, <laughs> maybe we can, we can talk about this. But there's a big issue there that has to do not so much with translation, but with untranslatability. Right. Let's just turn it around mm -hmm. um, and make it a, a much more ethnographic problem and not so much make it a given. So it's always the question, when we're talking about social practice, the, the question always comes, oh, are we being ethical with the community? Are we being considerate enough? Are we being, turn it into those people going in the late 19th century with their cameras into Africa, trying to take pictures with each totally. other's people and asking these questions the same. Totally. It's an absurd question. If we, we turn it around. Let's just go the other way. Let's go completely around and make it a more political question. What is the, the how can the community produce an untranslatable language that regardless if I live in the same neighborhood as someone else, um, it's impossible to understand. What is the, the, the possibility or the potentiality is the, the appropriate word that this untranslatability can, can give us out of the community. Um, when I see, for instance, in the protocols where it's Lola Arias in, in Argentina, um, it's very interesting how there's a non-accessible dimension to the work. And that's where the power is. It's not so much in how we teach the community to do so and such, but how much the community, and I don't want to say teach back, but how much the community can find a different aesthetic device, dispositive, if we want to use the correct French word, um, to actually re-engage the, 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 the social interaction. And that's, that's how, where, where we go back to aesthetic assessment. So, sorry, I took up this whole, just wanted to make a little synthesis of everything. Um, how do we take the, because it goes back to the aesthetic assessment. It would be naive to not aesthetically assess community and social practices, but it would also, um, because they are in, inserted yeah, in an aesthetic in, in aesthetic organization, but it's it's much more how to how to question how can a community practice change the way in which aesthetic political distribution is being uh, commonly accepted. See what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to turn into into into. But I think just it's kind of switching the the, the, the question around. So I want to make sure we don't miss Bartos because yeah, he's sure. trying. Yes. <coughs> the, my experience is that. that um, all these distinctions we are talking now, mostly I, I felt that they are trapping me. I'm, I'm in a trap when I use them. So uh, the theater is a very direct uh, field. I mean, that's, uh, the, the, the idea is just to keep this directness as strong as much as possible. And the first thing I, I did, I just tried to avoid that we do theater, opening my space, opening, uh, opening the venue. So, Trying, that's, that's what exactly I had this experience that uh, people don't trust. They don't identify with the culture, with the cultural lever of communication. The culture is something which is outside of them. And if you are trying to communicate on the social, if you say, I'm, so, I'm not an artist, I'm social, I do social work, it's also the same. 
it's it's very difficult, but it's also very important to uh, to to create the the, the, the place of the, the the space of the identification and how to do it. Is, it's a lot of work. It's uh, I think it's uh, it's making traps. It's because we do regular theater in some way, but we just uh, are doing regular performances and big festival. We are reinforcing social uh, direct uh, relation with the community, for example. But we don't call it like that. You know, it's. Just, uh, there's, there are two, two dimensional dis uh, discussions and two level of discussion, maybe more even. That one is uh, how we, we uh, just this meta language uh, we, we do now, and the second one is this direct, uh, which is uh, for me was very important. That I have to make venue and uh, culture in, in venue uh, organically circulate, uh, <coughs> circulating in in the community. That's that's the point. You know how to make it in a natural way. Mm -hmm. How to really have this feeling that your activity is reinforcing the community uh, community power and just identification with community. That people think together we are stronger or together we can communicate better, etc. etc. Et this 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 is a fantastic experience that uh, I, I had. This that that really changed a lot of lives. You know, and with uh, uh, with also big um, uh, uh, satisfaction of artistic work as well. So we didn't never distinguish it, you know. It's, it was always uh, combined so much, uh, and so much deeply, that as much it was uh, uh, more human, it was also more artistical, in, in fact. So uh, sometimes we're, uh, I, I think that the, the general discussion a little bit uh, losing the point. I mean, that's because maybe sometimes it's more simple, uh, it's, it's a little bit simpler, <coughs> more, more direct. How to revive this relation uh, uh, of the spectator? Because we can we can say the community, but we can just the spectator. I think that the social social discussion is now important and uh, bringing it back to the professional professional uh, film uh, festival industries, uh, big theaters, because it's giving you the fundamental. A relation which is which is a little bit lost and in Europe I can say that it's lost when you go to many many places you can you can feel that it's a this critical moment of this relation you know mm. that it's a little bit more getting <coughs> ivory tower ivory tower every every just over invested uh, very sophisticated a lot of people around of course very v vivid uh, discussion and very vivid, vivid, vivid ideas but just the basic thing which is which is Still reminding that the theater was always the part of the vita quotidiana, of, the, of something which is daily life, and it was the really part of the society, society life, not only of the group of the society. <coughs> I don't. Maybe this is measure of the times, but I still believe that it can it can happen back. And I know that we are dealing in Europe with these problems very seriously. As well. I have a bit, bit, uh, I have the problem, or maybe the dilemma, that um, I would say, as much as I want arts and politics to merge and, and, and have moments where they m get indistinguishable. I'm, I'm really not interested in, in weakening the term art. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe that everybody is an artist. I'm not interested in weakening the term politics. I think a lot of political, so-called political critical engaged work is not, is not that. So, so uh, how to at the same time to get strong definitions of art and politics in a way and different ones of course but at the same time uh, put them on the table, and and uh, and at the same time trying to bring the two things together. That's uh, I think in a way from for me, and that come more from from arts than from uh, uh, from uh, politics in a way. So, so it's, uh, that's that's the interesting question for me. And I think um, like, we did a project that was called Truth is Concrete, which of course uh, the truth is a. Uh, it's impossible. Eh? We, we learned that we cannot talk about truth, uh, it's, uh, uh, and concrete is also very difficult. So what, it was in a way a self, a self um, provocation to us, where we were, I think, very much interested, are very much interested in, in, um, in artistic work. Like a lot of the performance I like to see. I mean, there are five people in the audience, so it's not exactly. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, uh, and 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 it's, uh, and uh, and uh, I. I Many a part of a generation where we grew up with the idea that uh, that uh, uh, everything is extremely contingent and you you cannot name one thing without ex at the same moment naming the other and so on and uh, and the notion of truth of course was is totally impossible and uh, how, so it, for me it got more and more interesting to say yes I know this and I don't mean we need to step back but uh, how do we how do we can put out statements let's say as working statements at least how do we let do we get and, uh, <coughs> That, uh, how do we get in a maybe Chantal Mouffian way to, to, to real um, um, agonistic field 
where, uh, where we play out our, our, our positions in, in that. And that's a bit for me the, the question, like how to keep strong, strong definitions and at the same time bring them together. Uh, and, and, not, and, and that's why also, like maybe the situation in Germany and part of Europe is a bit different, but a lot of the work that engages uh, audience or, or brings on uh, society on stage, community protocol, etc. I, I, I like and, and, and I appreciate and so on, but I, I would at the moment not call political, for example. It really would not be an example for me that I would mention in this table. Uh, and, and, and relational aesthetics would definitely be nothing I would mention in this table. <laughs> uh, in, uh, this kind of homeopathic definition of politics and maybe art, I'm not, not uh, really interested in. So that's yeah. my, my dilemma, I guess. Can you tell us a, more, a little more detail about Truth of Concrete? <coughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, to make it brief, it, it way came out of this question th uh, to see that uh, um, when we're traveling, uh, that a lot of artists, and, and you know the situation, it was before Occupy, uh, but going to Cairo and, and then later to Occupy or to Moscow where the demonstrations are, that of course there are a lot of artists in there from the very first moment, uh, but uh, the dilemma very often is, as you know, like are, are they there as, as citizens, like only citizens, or are they also in some way as artists? Like how can, to, how can they use artistic practice in this situation? I found this question quite interesting because that was a question that was came coming up really in very different parts of the world. And uh, that brought us to think of also that, uh, uh, but I just said that the certain notion of the political, the political already, the critic, criticality and so on, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, came in the arts that we were interested in maybe to, towards an end. So to say like, you know, the, the idea of the, the, the private is the political was, of course, meant to politicize the private. Uh, and uh, the idea of the aesthetical is the political was to politicize the aesthetical. Yeah. But it seems somehow maybe the equation turned around in the other direction to, uh, to a certain point. And, and, and all the self-interest also of art in, 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 as, a, as a really political means kind of came, came to an end. So we, we, we wanted to, to see, uh, in, in a way, with not knowing what it would be, but it's a kind of self-provocation, what it would mean to bring together people from, from activism, theory, and art, that we felt work on this small field of, of direct engagement, and uh, uh, which enabled us, in, in a way, also to, to drop a lot of criteria that we had yes. and to find new ones, and I, I, I was still finding new ones, I'm not far from being there, yeah. uh, but to find out what is this small shared field with strong notions of art and activism and so on, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but to bring people together on this, this field, and for this we did, an, it was a 170 hours marathon, really 170 hours non-stop non -stop program, very rigidly uh, um, tactic, uh, tactic, that by the clock divided uh, in, in very rigid time frame, so if it was one hour, it was over after one hour, there was no way of uh, stepping over it, so it had a very strong curatorial notion, which was important for me. So it was an art institution doing that. Yeah, it was not trying to simulate to be Occupy or whatever. And at the same time, it had a, a, a very open surrounding where things could happen where we would not interfere. So to try to really uh, um, contrast these things. And it, so we invited, actually invited 200 people from really all over the world uh, to contribute, plus 100 grants for, uh, for other people and, and of course normal public. And it was uh, running around this field. And, and tr trying to define itself around these topics. And, and we try to, uh, to say, for the end, we try to focus on strategies and tactics because we thought, in a way, just to, this might be a possibility to stay concrete. Because uh, the context, of course, uh, so the translation problem is there, obviously. But we thought the context is coming with the people anyway. They talk about it, it will be there. But when we maybe uh, talk concretely about their practices, maybe we find out that certain practices are quite easily translated Absolutely. at the same time, uh, with all the different contexts. So that was the, uh, this uh, project. Can we hear from the, our guests? Oh, yeah. My name is Miranda Wright. I'm an independent producer in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I, I came to the table because I wanted to address this question of what are your biggest challenges that make you feel like you almost can't go forward, even though you know the work is important, so you must. Uh, uh, I, I produce a project called Cooking Oil that um, is by Deborah Asimwe. And, uh, has been in development in East Africa going into its fourth year. Um, so two challenges, and we have an excellent designer, <laughs> Jan Scrifano, who Michael works with. Um, uh, two major challenges that we have come across. One is just the sheer duration that is required to develop a project 
that allows you to reach a point of, of true, uh, uh, true reciprocity and collaboration as opposed to landing and teaching, which we're not, that's not our intention, and a duration that allows for aesthetic rigor um, <coughs> when, when working with people who are, you know, are, are, we're really combining two aesthetics. They're an East African and an American, so it's not so simple to, to rehearse in that way. Um, and then the second major challenge being that of um, power, especially related to resources. <coughs> the, the play itself is about international relief aid, so you know our project may be even more sensitive to it than, than others, but it's bothersome that the funding for the project is all coming out of the United States, and, uh, uh, and, and that just kind of intrinsic power dynamic of Americans going to work on something collaborative and all the funding being based and, and controlled by US organizations uh, is something that it's not possible for us to, nav there's not a lot of uh, public arts funding in East Africa, so it's not like it's something we can easily accomplish, but it's a conversation we're having all the time. So I'm just wondering uh, if any of you have experience in dealing with kind of more sensitive um, power dynamics and uh, how you deal with durational projects that can be challenging. I have, a, I have a, actually I want to lean. I'm, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't have <laughs> the answer. But I, but but what I'm what I'm, I'm I, as I'm sort of listening and so what what I'm trying to sort of connect some tissue or I don't know if that's right. But like so you said looking for strategies and tactics and then it's sort of like dot 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 and I was like well strategies and tactics for what um, is what I was unclear about and 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 I feel like like. Like there's an important, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking the table collectively, how do, we, how do we connect this, right? Because it feels to me that there is, um, you know, part of the, what initially led this to me was, 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 was um, uh, Pablo Haguera's book, A Handbook for Socially Engaged Art. Such a good book. And I read that, it's a great book, but on the other hand, I was like, oh wow, the visual arts finally discovered something that theater and dance <laughs> have been doing for 40 years. Well, but Pablo is a theater artist. Uh, uh, he was trained in theater, tra but, but, it's, but, he, but, he, but he made the impact in the visual arts world, I guess. And I think so. So what that opened up for me was this interesting universe of, of questions of, uh, that the young lady that was sitting here before was talking about, which is like, well, now that it's socially practiced and socially engaged art, it has legitimacy in in academia and in critical theory. Whereas before, when it was merely Euclid's doing stuff with the sanitation worker, maybe it didn't have the same right. credibility or when it was right. when it was, you know, Cornerstone or right. LAPD or right. uh, whatever. So I, so so what I guess what I'm seeing I'm I'm hearing these different levels of thing. One which is like I'm in the trenches, I'm trying to do this work and we're gonna like, you know, and, and what are the challenges there? And then I'm like, well I've I've gathered, you know, two hundred people from around the world and we haven't really like I'd be curious to know like Honestly, like, were they from Western Europe, or for, were they from? Was it ethnically diverse, culturally diverse, politically diverse? Um, and and having a very serious critical discourse in Europe about that, and how does the critical discourse that is happening there relate to practical challenges on the ground, and how do the practical challenges that we face in terms of trying? And to to Jan's point, like this came up yesterday. It's like, you know, the evaluative criteria. You know, if we if we hold and Ping Chong Ping talks a lot about this. It's like, well, if we hold, you know, the aesthetic criteria of Western European art structures, and we look at, you know, certain work from other ethnic origins or other cultural conditions, and then we lay those evaluative structures on them, um, is that, you know, are we are we are we are we setting preconditions for failure, or are we setting are we are there inherent aesthetic biases that we are then using that are, so, so, so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is how do we sort of pull these things into discord in a way? How do we take these discussions that, you know, okay, well great, now that it's called socially engaged art, the academic, the, 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 the ivory tower now thinks there's value here. <laughs> um, now how do we use that to translate to, and you would know, because you work in the universities, you would understand this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't blame her. Don't blame her. But this yeah. is what I'm trying to pull yeah. together, because and, and it comes up a lot because I think that like that you know I think and this is my part. This is one of my things is that I is that I found you know it's like like in America our our multicultural system our multicultural world is a very very different world than that in Europe or in Asia or in Latin America or in 
uh, uh, the Middle East. Like all of these places are multicultural and we live in a global society, even if you go to, you know, um, uh, anywhere, like they're multicultural. And we're all negotiating living with difference in, the, in these places. And these have ramifications in capital allocation and our production structures Absolutely. replicate capital systems. And, um, and, 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 and value is created through intellectual, contextual material. So, so how, do we, how do we bring this world of ideas around these uh, down, not down to, but in correspondence with actual practice on the ground and, and, and build a meaningful conversation so that, so that people who are doing, so that we can create aesthetic structures or. I mean, one thing I would say is at different moments we each find different touchstones. You know, and right now, writing, um, I'm, and you're talking about, well, tactics and strategies for what? And I was thinking of, well, for a history of art that's not only imagining, but also doing. And I'm quoting this great um, quote, Muriel Rukeyser, the poet Muriel Rukeyser, in The Life of Poetry, she said, because you have imagined love, you have not loved. Because you have imagined brotherhood, you have not made brotherhood. You may think that you have, but you have not. And I just love that quote, and I feel it's relevant to what you're talking about, Andy, that it's not, of course the imagining is wonderful and important. I'd never say leave aesthetics out or I wouldn't sit at this table. But it's not enough. It's not the same. For those of us who want our work to be both an imagining and a doing, we have to go beyond what happens in, in these small rooms. Now, depending on what's happening outside the room, we have different opportunities. Lots of things make it different. So that's the, the one thing. I just want to make three things. I, something that you said way early ago um, made me think of Bill T. Jones. You know, like, how do you bring people in who you would like them to be part of it, but they don't want to be part of what you're doing? Yeah. And I just remember when he was making Still Here, and he said, the questions that I have can't all be answered in the art world. How do people live with terminal illness? Yeah. And he needed to go outside the art right. world. I mean, yeah. I think that need is, like, super important. What is it? And if we go out with a genuine need, people can feel the difference. Yeah, how do we and get them into our club? Like, we're in a club here, how do we get out but of it, our But the club, club is a bigger no, club it's because not, it's an it's ecosystem. Not, it's, not, it's, not they're, they're as it's much a part of it because it's Bill T. Jones as a human being trying to yeah, live yeah. with, with a, being HIV positive. It's not because he's an artist. There are many people living with terminal illness where they're artists or not, and that was a reason to bring them together because he is an artist and wanted to make a piece about it. And then just the last thing I wanted to say to, to you in terms of the problem with who's funding what, I just heard this great woman speak, Shanna Ratner. If anyone heard Liz Lerman and, and Jolie Willie Jo Zoller the other night at the, at the Y uh, talking about poverty and wealth, and this great woman who works in thinking about wealth, she says, well, there's seven kinds of wealth. Money's not the only kind of wealth. And if you have a progressive way of trying to eradicate poverty, then no one kind of wealth can wipe out another. So for example, one of the examples she gave was, so, so in, the, in the pursuit of economic wealth, you can't wipe out natural wealth and natural resources and take them all for yourself. So once you start thinking of the different kinds of wealth and who's contributing what, I mean, I think you're, you're there. First of all, you're working with Shannon, who's great. And, so, and, 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 but secondly, you're talking about reciprocity, and I found that a very helpful thought, the different kinds of wealth. I think that, uh, you know, to answer a little bit your question, is that um, uh, in order for academia to kind of like um, address this, they, they need to, um, there's a new practice here. And rather than talk about the practice, they need to embrace, it, embrace the practice. And this is an example of this, as horizontal as this as can be, 50% of the people that should be in the conversation is not here. Absolutely. The non, the non, well, yeah, the non-art, you know, like, you know, if you look at this as a partnership of artists and non-artists, or however you want to call them, we need to stop doing this. <laughs> and we need to open the conversation, yeah. right? Um, and then to answer both of your questions is that uh, you, we all have to forget that, you know, this is our project. We have to come to the table with an extremely open agenda. And just knowing, you know, where are your resources and you know what is it that you can give, and it might take, you know, for you to work with this other group and you know work the way they want to work mm -hmm. and with the with the objectives that they want yeah. until you build trust mm -hmm. and you know and you build equity. And equity is not about 50-50. Equity is, you know, how many resources you have and how many we have and what is it that we can put on the table. I want to speak to something in response to Gonzalo because Gonzalo partnered with Ping Chang and Company to do something that I feel really was successful, and to, and to speak to your question, and to something Simon said earlier about um, you know, 
it's not just why do we do this, but what can we do with this? So Pim Chong and Company made a piece called Secret Survivors, which was working with survivors of child sexual abuse. And we weren't sure who was going to come to that. We weren't sure who was going to tell their story, and we weren't sure who was going to hear, particularly <coughs> in the arts funding world and in the traditional theater world, who was going to show up to hear these stories. And Gonzalo saw a reading of it, and he invited us to El Museo to present it at El Museo. Now, this, on the surface, doesn't is that this wasn't a piece about Latino survivors of sexual abuse. This was a piece about all survivors of sexual abuse. So on the surface, it doesn't necessarily appear that maybe it's the right fit for El Museo. And he invited us into his theater to do this and was able to make it free. So anyone who could come, could come. And it was uh, sold out a month in advance. But the interesting thing about it was that the people who came, they weren't coming to see Ping Chong and Company necessarily. They weren't coming because they'd been to El Museo before necessarily. They were coming because they wanted to hear about survivors of sexual abuse using art to address this issue that isn't being addressed in the mainstream art world and that isn't being addressed in the mainstream media outside of a sensational news version of it. You're not hearing from the survivors' voices. So I feel like what Gazala was able to offer us as a theater company was to go into a space that we're not normally in to bring an audience to us that it isn't normally coming to us. And in that piece, in that collaboration, I really feel like we were able to cross a lot of these barriers. And so the question of you know, why do we do it and why is it important is we're telling stories <coughs> that aren't being told elsewhere. That's what we can offer. And addressing these issues through art, and that's what we can offer. Just really quickly, now that we're bringing it back down to like practicality as opposed to theory, could you maybe explain the how of that? How did you fill the room? Uh, how did we feel the room? <laughs> okay. Well, partly the people who are in the show are engaged with their own communities and they are each acting as their own advocates for their own stories. And so we had five survivors, each one of whom was able to reach out to their own networks. We had an audience of people who already were engaged with Ping Chang and Company or were already on the El Museo okay. yeah. engagement. And we reached out to the network of um, sexual violence intervention organizations in New York City and got the word out. And we made it free. And I think, I mean, I know Absolutely. we can't always make it free, but yeah. if you can make it free, a lot of people are going to yeah. come to the table that can't go <coughs> to the restaurant otherwise. And I think there was an alignment of values. You know, it wasn't necessarily um, when, when I decided to join that project, it was because I felt personally that, you know, it needed to be done. Uh, and I think everybody, you know, in this partnership, and not only the two of us, but, you know, the, the, the performers and everyone, everybody believed in, in values around the display. And I think, you know, that, that transpires. And that's, you know, how you know, many networks can get together. And you can just get 600 people. You know, I would like to just, just we, we have one person at the table we haven't heard from. So can we uh, sure. hear from you? Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Benasraf. I am uh, a scenic designer and I'm co-artistic director of the Assembly and working at the Living Theater right now. <clears throat> uh, I, I was thinking a lot about Jan's question, or sorry, Melanie's question, oh, um, and uh, regarding why, what the challenges are that we face, of course. Um, the one that really strikes me is that there seems to be a general prejudice against theater that is involves social practice, that is a somehow is lesser of an artistic form. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I hear what Florian says about wanting to keep these really strong distinctions between politics and art, but I think part of, part of keeping those strong distinctions is that there's this assumption that art in general is not political or social, um, and that somehow um, we have the mainstream work or work in general tends to have a neutral character, which I, which I think is a problem because you know, we have a lot of work that's happening all over the place that is contributing to our society in some way, and reinforcing norms or not. Um, and those, and it's really in these times that we can find these, these niches that have yet to be spoken and articulated that we find the most potent change sometimes. But in general, I find that there's still room to basically articulate art as a place in general that is having a political and social impact all the time. Yeah, I, I don't think that, not to speak for foreign, but I don't think that, uh, I don't think that anybody is, is saying that the work isn't, that work is, I, I think isn't inherently political. I mean, I think that it's such a huge fraught topic um, in terms of like, you know, I think that, uh, I think, I think, for, for me, I think that what is political is not, I mean, it's interesting, it's like there's sort of traditional theater narrative storytelling, which is one form of addressing kind of like issues in, a, in one form, but the production, the way an art project is made is political. 
um, you know, the way it is funded is political, the, the, the presentational aesthetics, but like everything has a political valence. And I think um, what's, what's sort of rising up for me as I'm listening to everyone is actually this really interesting distinction between people talking about creating more traditional works of art that engage with social issues or perhaps use non-self-identified art people, non-self-identified artists as <coughs> participants in the making of that work. And then, and then also a sort of idea of non-traditional art making that investigates these ideas around politics and aesthetics um, and, um, and, and social issues. And you know, I think like when you talk about, um, and this is where sort of Michael's distinction about civic practice versus social practice comes in and starts to become um, helpful, I think. Um, when you talk about the work of a Rimini Protocol, the way that they do, uh, you know, with what's a hundred people in the hundred percent, hundred percent, you know, like that's a their very specific mode of sort of socially engaged work. Um, and I think, I think, I think one, I think. Um, uh, Jan, Jan, pointed out something that actually we need to ask ourselves a lot of questions in terms of as art makers, you know, I, the two sort of things that have bubbled up for me in terms of what contemporary is versus like regular theater, you know, is contemporary practice tends to exist, in, it, to me there's two things. One is it's interrogative and one is that it's investigative, right? So it's <coughs> investigative meaning, you know, using um, the sort of devised theater idea, thank you, idea. Uh, you know, these people, this place, this time, what are we going to make? So there's this idea of like, we're going to investigate something, we're not starting with an answer. And I think when I listen to sort of this idea, like, I think that's actually a great complication in socially engaged work. Are you coming in with an answer and saying, why aren't you into what I'm into? Absolutely. I want to offer you this. Or is there something that exists in the world that is curious, like Bill T is like, I've got to learn more about this. And I think those of us who are constantly bemoaning the lack of audiences, <laughs> Um, you know, should think about pointing our attention outside of what we do and into the world as investigative agents. The, I'm almost done, I'm sorry. And then um, the other piece is interrogation, which is like the interrogation of the assumptions around what we do. Are we in a theater? Are we not in a theater? What are the assumptions of the theater? If we're not in a theater, why are we there? What does time mean? What does space mean? What does embodiment mean? What do the words that I think I'm saying actually mean? And, and, and when we start to interrogate those questions, then we start to develop a contemporary aesthetic, which doesn't take any of these things for granted. So, so I think there's a tension here that we need to, as our art, people involved in this arts ecology, need to start asking ourselves. Both, you know, both directions. One is like, you know, because, oh, oh, the thing about um, Pablo's book was that he talks about this project where, you know, if you go into the community and you do the video work and then, you know, you de create a protest but nobody from the community actually comes, is it successful artwork? And it's like, well, I don't know. You know, it's like, it, and to me, the fact that you would even ask that question is sort of like pointing to the problem. Right? It's like if you make the video and you stage a protest for workers' rights in Queens and then you put it in a gallery and all the art people come and look at it but nobody in the actual community actually like, was affected, then it was not successful no matter how many you know, people in our forum say it was. So but I'm, 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 I'm hyper Let's hear from our other Hi, I just want to interrogate name? something. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm Daniel Banks. <laughs> I'm co-director of DNA Works and co-director of Theater Without Borders and I teach in the Masters in Applied Theater at CUNY with Jam. And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> proud of fan club. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple pieces that I'd like to try to um, tie together because I think it's very important. We started off with some language around non-educated versus educated, non-artists versus artists, and that really got the conversation going. Um, that language is actually dialectical thinking. If it's not black, it's, if it's not day, it's. Um, where did dialectical thinking come from? It came from a tradition of Western rationalism. Where, when did Western rationalism begin? What major world event was happening at the time that Western rationalism began? Anybody? Oh, professor. <laughs> well, no, I mean, please, I think it's really please. important that we understand <laughs> this connection. Yes. Tell us. The, the, the tell colonialism, us. colonization, the, the, the chattel slave trade, 
So as certain European philosophers were creating the language by which we would determine who people were in the world, we were being taught to think in these dialectics so that one quote unquote race, which doesn't biologically exist, of people was good and one was bad, one right. was smart and one was ignorant. So it, taking a page from King's work, we are even at this table using a language to try to discuss our work that forces us into a binary of separation that, that automatically separates us. John Guare writes in his play, Bosoms and Neglect, there's, it's a loose quote from one of the characters who's trying to communi communicate with a, 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 a father who's starting to have some dementia says, I just hope that I'm gonna find the right combination of words that's going to get through to him and unlock it and, and I'm gonna be able to have a real interaction with him and he's gonna know how much I love him and how much I care for him. So I think words, language, locks, um, unlocking. And I just wanna advocate for spectrum thinking and spectrum mm -hmm. speaking. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that we as practitioners and artists who have, who have championed our capacity for creativity to take responsibility for speaking in a way that, that creates a space for all people and that, that, that everyone is literate in something. Everyone has been educated in something by some formal or informal institution that makes them an expert at something. Now I'm now quoting another European person, but that's okay, you know, all people are philosophers. So it may not be that all people are artists, but first of all, what is our definition of art? Um, who gets to wear that title? I can't tell you the number of institutions that we go into and we insist, uh, not insist, but we, we gently, <laughs> gently coerce our hosts um, to, uh, to not have you know, workshops with just the quote unquote the artists or the student artists. Students, faculty, and staff, volunteers, staff, and docents. Um, you know, that, that we're bringing people together and you know, we all know how many people are working day jobs who actually are brilliantly talented artists who because of the economics of art don't make their primary living through it. So not only are there actually, I would say, you know, studied, trained artists who are lurking in other places in, in the work that we do, but um, you know, I'm really fascinated by this question of like, on one side of the table, if you call people artists, you're, you're, or if you call people artists, it's coercive, and on the other side of the table, I mean, it's just really fascinating. I've, we've, you know, the, creating a space for people's creativity to show up. Mm -hmm. Finding the right combination of words where people step into their creative beings and their creative selves and produce, as I think it was you or the person sitting there before you, mm -hmm. saying, you know, really brilliant work from a non necessarily trained, formally trained perspective. How do we find the language that actually, in this particular kind of work, maybe not in all settings, but in this particular kind of work, embraces all possibilities and leaves room for people I think to that's show I up. I mean, Daniel, that's kind of it. Yeah, I'm just. What I'm trying to do is put in head within the shadow to see if I can get it to click. Um, the you were saying that it's always this binary dialect. Right. Well, right. not always, but no, it's no, but, but no, exactly how we're talking. It. And, and I agree with what you're saying. But, but I want to go and take it a little bit more radically. What if you don't resolve this dialect? Because the, I think the problem is that we're always talking in this binary world, thinking that this is the, That's right. the solution of it. That's right. And, and going back to your question and taking it into a more practical approach, as someone said. Um, how do you do with, when you have to go with American funding into whatever other country that is always going to hate the American country, of course. Um, <laughs> well, we would, I'm sure. Um, so what, what do you do with it? I think the best way to do it is not to assume that there's a transparency in how the funding goes back and forth, because that would be to assume this very simple dialectics, but rather to radicalize it Absolutely. and make, make this difference very evident. Mm. There's going to be a difference. That's why I was talking about untranslated, whatever I was trying to say. Um, <laughs> it means, what I'm trying to say is there's always gonna be a part of the other culture that is never gonna be understandable mm -hmm. to you. And there's always gonna be a part of you that is never gonna be understandable to them. If you assume that principle, I think that very creative and powerful work can come up from, we're never gonna be able to deal with this. I think that's what you have to do. 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 I think that's what you have to
to our working on in Latin America vis-a-vis what um, Edwin is talking about? Well, actually, um, actually, maybe maybe it's actually it's precisely this moment in which some sort of like hybridization of knowledge or like new cultural production might come up, and this is actually what we've been talking about. Like, oh, oh, sorry. Um, how, <laughs> what, what, um, what, what, what? Well, maybe, maybe we can. I can, I can just say what we, what we, mm. what we did in in, in Bogota. So what, what we want to do is we want to. Um, yes, we the Goethe Institute. Um, we want to. Um, we want to start a a, um, a bigger project that actually uh, involves activists, artists, curators um, from from these all these different fields. And and we had a, a preliminary workshop in in Bogota where we invited people from different disciplines, from New York, from also from Los Angeles, from um, from Bogota, from Caracas, and from. Sao Paulo, in order to, 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 to find a way to develop formats which would be, um, which would be um, uh, um, actually good formats to, to approach this, this whole field. And I think a very sort of um, d important point is that there is this intelligibility of, there's always like a core of intellig unintelligibility of, 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 of the other and of, 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 of the of the f of the other fields of the other cultures of the other of the other subject that we kind of um, encounter and 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 this and this this unintelligibility can actually be the moment uh, which can be very productive for artistic production and um, this is actually what I think is mm. important I mean, maybe you want to add a little bit about what we so what it meant for me and I think it comes back to this whole question about why we're all involved in this practice is that actually it asks you fundamentally to step outside of it, all your assumptions about what you're doing and to look at you know what is the framework, what are the ways in which I can engage with this work, how can I read it, how can I get, uh, identify what's going on, I need to understand the context, I need to understand the language, I need to understand the frameworks from which those artists are coming and I need to understand then the frameworks in which that particular project is being made. So, and actually, I think that's critical not just for the way we think about socially engaged practice, but all artistic practice, that we, we leave our assumptions aside and we say, how do I really engage with it? How do I understand what is going on here? And I need to understand a lot about the, the, um, the context because that often is uh, informing a lot of the content. I need to look at the, the kind of uh, participants and what skills are being brought here in order to look at the intentionality of the piece and what it's saying both for the people involved in it and how we are reading it. And I also need to look at how is it being resolved? You know, what, what systems is it engaging with? And I think that's a healthy thing for us to do about all work we look at. Otherwise, we end up with notions that, in a sense, perpetuate the practices that have built you know, these, these buildings. You know, a lot of the nature of art support um, internationally has been built around creating very specific kinds of practices within very specific kinds of architecture which frame the way not only a work is made, but the way it's received. And I think you know, there's something great for you know, Florian to have five people in his audience to see something, but it says something about how sustainable and how engaged is that with what else is happening. So I think the, pr the bigger question is the, n the infrastructure we've created over the last 200, 300 years to support the arts are fundamentally challenged by a lot of socially engaged practice, and that's why it's important, because it makes us think about what is the work? How, who is it for? How is it going to be seen by those people? You know, touring doesn't cannot really exist. You know, we need to rethink all the mechanisms. Absolutely, and right. that's really crucial. Absolutely. Can, right. can I just say on the, on the sort of semi-pragmatic side in relation to this also that you know Andy brought up a lot of things about form. We haven't we haven't actually really talked much about form because we're talking about other interesting things. But of course, it's all connected. And I, I just want to I want to say that. Um, I feel like one of the reasons, certainly that I, and I think a lot of artists uh, more and more are exploring different kinds of engaged work, is that if we look at theater as not just being plays, but being a spectrum of performative activity that is as uh, unknowable as whatever the next artist can imagine, then actually collaborating with individuals and entities that don't come as right. artists to the table right. mean that we have the opportunity to discover forms totally. that we do not mm. currently know. So I know that you know we, we have a project that started as a 
sort of social practice show with community members around urban change where the audience planned a city and it was five years ago and now five years later that show has turned into a modifiable form that we're working with planning commissions all over the United States helping them work in diverse underserved communities on how to use this arts-based project to actually do planning for how resources will be allotted in those communities. So whereas we thought we made this thing that was the thing, now it's actually a thing that keeps changing. Is it a rural community? Is it an urban community? Is it a suburban community? Is it in Kansas? Is it in Oregon? We are, we are learning through that practice because it's now sort of in service to, but we are still collaborating and conceptually developing it with. So I just want to say part of what feels like it, it comes back to what you said, Andy, some projects start with a goal of expression and they know what they want to express or they do the digging to get to the thing they want to express. And some projects start as inquiry. And the goal isn't to complete the inquiry and then share the results. The goal is actually to make more inquiry and to right. invite others into a shared inquiry. Right. And, for, and for me, Better formally, than. Those distinctions, not to be binary, because I really agree with the spectrum <laughs> approach, but I do want to say that I can delineate much, much, much work in our respective fields on projects that have at their core an impulse to express a known or discovered quantity versus those that seek to continue being curious. And for me, that distinction or that spectrum really, really helps me get a handle on where the work is coming from and on where the sort of openings and learnings are. Touche. Now, I, I want to tag on everybody. <laughs> um, first of all, Michael, absolutely. I mean, I feel like if anything that's going to determine how I understand aesthetics, it's that. Who's inquiring and who, you know, who's asking and tearing their hair out and who actually has something they already figured out that they're burning to share. Okay, fine. The, a couple of things in respect to measurement, in respect to the word strategies, in respect to how do we think about moving from local to international, etc. I mean, um, one is that, and going back to also what Daniel was talking about in terms of binaries that, that grew out of colonialism, mm -hmm. there's also the transactional binary that performance contains, right? We do something, you come, right? In, in many ways, there's, it's a transaction and it's, a, and it's also in, in this time of late stage capitalism, which has a whole other kind of meaning attached to it. So I, I think that one of the things that certainly I've been thinking about for, since I started the foundry is like, what, what is the, beyond transactional position of what it is we do. And so, and I s tried to say this also back to you when you wrote to me about my piece that I wrote in mm -hmm. HowlRound. One of the things that I'm trying to learn to do is put aesthetics aside mm -hmm. because I am the only person that's responsible for my aesthetics. And as you know what I mean, I, I don't want to influence the way aesthetic practice is taken or not taken by a given person. I, but I do think about the dimensionality, which Daniel calls a spectrum, but I actually think about it as a personal dimensionality, which doesn't only apply to artists, it applies to everyone in the world. If we're going to live in the world, we're more than the sum of what it is we do, right? And so I, I wanted to talk about measurement in outs, I want to think about measurement outside of these transactional um, um, processes and think about it in a kind of dimensional way, which is why I wonder, and also I don't think that all of us, there's no such thing as a model. If we can get rid of anything, can we please, please <laughs> get rid of the word model? Because that also starts that whole bullshit leadership thing. We've got the best way and now everybody should, end, you know, mm. if we're going to talk about horizontalism, we're talking about an ecology of practice, of thinking, etc. It's the only way we're going to change the world, enough of the models. But that to say how we begin to, I mean, I wish I could spend a week with you all 
Like, I'm dying to talk to you about everything <laughs> because I, I'm on fire every day trying to figure out how to invite people. Where's that young man? Like, how do you invite people into the inquiry? Like, what's the flavor and how do we share the invitation with other people and not be the only inviters? And I also think that's one of the things that we're doing right now. I mean, we do a lot of different things, but one of the things that we do, we're doing right now is this program called the Audience Ambassadors. It's a kind of corny title, um, but it actually grew out of something that Lear de Bessonet started many years ago called Tickets for the People. But we, we took it and what we've done is because our relationships are primarily right now being built with social justice community, with low income communities organizing for social change, we have hired organizers to invite, pe to organize people in their communities to go to the theater, not just our theater, the theater. And so we're going all over town and we're seeing like crap and we're seeing amazing <laughs> things and being able to have the conversations afterwards not about do you like it or do you not like it, not about will you buy a ticket to that theater in a week, not about like, but really about the meat of what's the experience here, what you know, I mean, I can't tell you guys, it's been an amazing experience. We're not doing the inviting, they are. All we're doing is scrambling around trying to get free tickets all the damn time, which is hard, but because um, there's 50 people, right? Who's gonna give me 50 tickets all the time? But I guess all this to say that there's a kind of dimensionality about who we are as human beings. We happen to be, I happen to consider myself, to call myself an artist, but I think economists <laughs> feel the same way. You know what I mean? And I think that considering our dimensionality outside of the measurement of, for example, we're gonna come for free this time and next time we're gonna pay. Or we're gonna build a relationship with this community and then they're suddenly gonna come to every show I do. Or like all this bullshit. <laughs> It's but Melanie, I'm so excited. Wait, I, I just have to say, we unfortunately are at time. So we actually, we're not even going to be able to hear from the other guests at the table, but this conversation can continue. Do you want to? They can continue anywhere, everywhere, at all times. <laughs> no, we have to go. Can I have three, three hashtags? What? Hashtags. Three hashtags. Three hashtags. definition of success. Yes. Decolonize our practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. And understand our role and limitations. And one question, what happens when you profession. go home? That's what I think Melanie's asking. Can, after you, you leave the theater, after you leave the art, what mm. happens next? Tomorrow. And you can all discuss this in the lobby <laughs> or, or, or here. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you participating. For Thank you so much.